Biggest misconception is about the numbers. This crisis narrative that is reinforced by international organizations, by the media, I think it is misleading and it's even self-defeating. I'm Eleni. Eleni Diker. I'm working as a researcher at Migration Research Center at Koç University. Before that, I was working for International Organization for Migration. I worked there for four years. And I'm also one of the uh, co-founders of an NGO named BOMOVU with an aim to use body movement and sports to empower refugees and disadvantaged groups. And I'm also trying to develop uh, projects that bring together civil society and academia, trying to encourage dialogue between different stakeholders. Many people now accept the fact that the lines between these categories are more blurred. For example, when we talk about economic migrants and forced migrants, there is a common tendency to see economic migrants as those who come voluntarily just to find a job. But economic migrants also escape from poverty. So I think being a refugee because of economic reasons should also be in the definition. Yes, this is a huge humanitarian crisis, this is true. But this is not, this crisis is not about the numbers of refugees, numbers of uh, migrants. This crisis is about the unwillingness of the developed nations to host sufficient numbers of refugees, unwillingness of them to share the responsibility. Look at the number of refugees in the world, in proportion to world population. It's only 0.3% of the world population, so this is a relatively stable number over time. When you use all these powerful words, like unprecedented, all-time high record numbers of refugees, I think this is really misleading. It undermines the public support for refugee protection and it also contributes to xenophobia that we are actually trying to eliminate. And I think this creates one of the most important misconceptions about mobility of people. When do, did we start to call this a refugee crisis? I think this was in 2015 when the crisis was Europeanized. I mean, when the crisis moved to Europe because in 2015 many people uh, went to Europe from Turkey by sea. It was almost one million people and it wasn't only Syrians, it was also Afghans, Iranians, Iraqis. And I think this is when we started to call this a refugee crisis because it arrived at the borders of Europe. We don't talk about Yemen, we don't talk about Sudan. Why? Because it will never arrive to the borders of Europe. I think this is where crisis comes from, the Eurocentrism of the field of migration and asylum actually. Before 2011, I think there was 10 to 15 NGOs working with migrants and refugees in Istanbul. But right now I can count more than 50 NGOs only in Istanbul, which are providing a diverse range of activities, very different kinds of activities. What happened after the arrival of Syrian refugees? Many NGOs had to cooperate because of the diversity of the needs of refugees. They are also women, they are also LGBT people, they are people with disabilities. So the civil structures that are supporting this women, women, LGBT people with disabilities, they also expanded their activities to also include refugees. So I think this created some kind of awareness. There has been a lot of improvements in that sense. Empowerment of Syrian NGOs, it's really important in this sense. There are a lot of Syrian NGOs, they even have uh, umbrella organizations to voice their concerns. But they are usually not in the meetings, NGO meetings. You don't find too many NGOs, Syrian NGOs represent in the civil society landscape, let's say. If an NGO is designing a project for Syrian refugees, I think you should definitely hire a Syrian refugee. This should be a standard regulation, in my opinion. If we have a genuine commitment to address the needs of refugees, we should try to find a way also in our internal organizations to include refugees' voices. <laughs>